Dun 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 Welcome back to another project getting projects done with me, Chris. And today we're working on finishing up uh the Reductus Saboteur. There's only just little details left to do, so it's gonna be a lot of little nitpicky things going on. Uh, I'm joined today with Mr. Boop of Hailing Boop Infamousy. Gonna say hi? Hey. <laughs> that was very enthusiastic. Um, that was good stuff. <laughs> Just, hey, how's it going? Okay. <laughs> All right. So, the majority of stuff has been done. I think I'm going to work on the sleeve, the yellow sleeve, and the little icon while I'm playing with yellow. And, yeah. You working on anything? Uh, no. No? Okay. Just chilling? Thought about it, but then I was like, yeah. Thought about it, then said, back it. Yeah, yeah, well, because earlier today it was house cleaning, cleaning the mom. I hear you. All right, I am going to get things started by using some contrast Ayandan yellow. And then I think, just for giggles, I will bust out the Nasdrag yellow just to push a little bit more brown values in. I could just as easily just use the Nasdrag yellow instead of the Iandan yellow, but I would do want a little bit of uh, more of an orangey quality alongside the brown. It'll push through both values, I think. So we're going to throw this on the mixer because you can see it's obviously very separated. So we're going to throw that right on the mixer. Get the old process running. When you're painting boop, do you work through various stages of color or are you just more concerned with just kind of getting a solid layer down and then like a solid highlight, little edge highlight and that's it? Can you explain what you're talking about? Like for example, do you, um, like when you're working, like do you use contrast more like just kind of slap it onto the onto the surface, or do you break it down and use thin layers to go through transitions? <laughs> I have no con. I have I have one thing of contrast. Yes, open it because the reason I got it was to help get um, like that platinum blonde tone mm -hmm. for like Elbar and Elfair, but I haven't painted any hair. On any elves that need it, because I originally got it for the pariah, the dude that follows the stern, not stern, that special sister of battle box with her and the uh, the graphic novel character with her and the uh, like Harlequin. Yep. I got it for his hair, and then for elves for fantasy, because I'm giving my you know actual Eldar play game work for natural hair tones. I mean, platinum blonde can be natural, but yeah, I think you get what I'm saying. Yep. Like, I'm, I'm using platinum blonde for like fantasy elves, so I had it for fantasy elves, which was kind of sad there. I know. But I have not used contrast. Okay. Well, I'm just, I'm just saying contrast, for example. I mean, there's, there's many things that we can use like contrast in the same fashion as contrast. I don't... Alright, let me put it this way. Except for um, the old GW Glaze paint, the green one. Get what it's called. I use that for... I slap that on like chemical throwers. If they have like a cloud of like chemical gas coming out, I slather that on. But m most of my painting is I guess more traditional. Miniature paints in a way where it's base color, maybe a transition to highlight. That makes sense. Yep. Yeah, that's more or less what I was getting at. It was just, you know, are you 
like I guess really is my question is do you find yourself doing more nuanced type of painting or do you just kind of just slap the mo uh, the paint onto the surface and you know like are you not concerned with you know finicky little transitions and stuff like that that's all I, I get you um, it's not an accusation or anything like that or you know no I was just trying to understand where you talk about it because you're talking this is the thing because there's contrast like the concept of contrast of, yeah of, of, like color and then there's the fucking contrast paint so it's like I never, when somebody says something like that I never know what the hell they're talking about right yeah I know so it, I it, um I would say a majority of times Yeah, you're not you're not too concerned with the finickiness of transitions and sh shit like that, right? I mean, to put this in context, though, ninety percent of the time I'm painting really dark. So. <laughs> right. Yeah, not a lot of. I mean, you can go, you know, the mile with them, but there's not really a lot there to. to, to you know, soldiers they wear fatigue, and they might have like a flak jacket or like a vest. Level. Yeah. They, they just get the paint and the highlight. But, I mean, I, I, I do have projects where I do go the mile and I get in there and do like little nuance. That's like the blue. Most of the time, it's just the same. And then I just do a nice highlight to call it a day. Doing a quick little edge, and that's that's it. Yeah. Yep. Sometimes I, I go the extra mile, and I'll sit there and like, here's a blood angel napkin I painted a while ago that I really, really uh, I almost did nuances with a wet blend. I guess the closest is when I work on the horse, because I have a I have a specific recipe that every time I paint horse, this is good recipe I follow. I wrote it down on every. Oh really? Uh, that involves a lot of um, probably I think smoke. Uh -huh. So so yeah. That I really get into the nuance, but I think it's just because I enjoy painting. Well, that's the important part, right? As long as you're enjoying that's, yourself and. That's very nuanced, because uh, as far as like I'm concerned, like that's probably one of the things I can go because uh, that that I build the highlights up like you normally would. But then I have to sit there afterwards and blend everything together because I use greens that don't match and yellows and white. So the skin looks weird. So I sit there and I come back with like glazes that I started making and put, put the layer of different glazes up over top of it. It's about as nuanced as I get. Gotcha. I don't do a lot of... Uh, Things like wet blending. I just feel like if I'm going to do something that needs to be blended together, I prefer to block out some color and come back and then lay something in. Like whether it's one color or a couple different colors, that's uh, how I approach painting. Right. I mean, yeah, like it's. You're, you're just more concerned with just getting the projects done rather than, you know, uh, finessing them to the point where you know you're gonna have like people judging it or anything like that right like you have no aspirations for competition type painting art do you uh, if it's not work related kind of paint competition no because uh work seems about as good as it gets <laughs> right so uh, i don't really paint for competition i mean I might paint for like a local competition, but and we have a few good painters, but I'm going to be honest, most local painting competitions, it's like 
there's every a bunch of people join them, but it's really only a bunch of people on our school join the top four team of fifty dollars. Right. Like I don't like disparaging other people's content, but that's just how it feels. Like you show up and then there's like three other painters that are like at your level and then everybody else is joining for ha ha fun. But I don't take paint I don't take paint competition seriously, so Right. Not saying other people can't, but could change at a later date but uh, as far as I'm concerned locally I might enter in a competition that's that's just that's but I'm not I'm not one of those people that you know signs up for or travels for it or yeah. goes out of their way for stuff yeah that's I hear half the time I don't finish it on time <laughs> yeah, same here. I mean, I I often struggle to uh, stay with a project and you know just see the damn things done. I guess I would I would say that because um, I just paint for the fun of it. But if I was to pursue something that was of a competitive or business nature, I would probably do commission painting for competition painting only because. I like the way I paint, and the way I paint is not necessarily like competition winning at the at the fair level. But I just paint for fun. Yeah, as most should. I wouldn't exactly say it's tabletop, but it's a little bit above that. That's because I'm having fun. A little bit, a little bit extra mile. I'm not going to sit there and wet the floors for ten hours. Or however long. Yeah. I hear you. It's also why we, I, I, I was telling you that I watched half of the Visions episode today. Why uh, my favorite episode of Vision so far is um, the Village Vibe. That's because I like that studio because they do really like unique and interesting character designs, but they're really, really like I don't think it's a spoiler saying that I like the Jedi wearing masks. Yeah, it's a very simple design. The one uh, episode that I thought was kind of interesting where it introduces an interesting idea into the Star Wars universe is the one with the um, the droid. It had that kind of Astro Boy quality animation to it. Oh, that one. I haven't gotten to that one yet. Oh, I thought you did. Oh, okay. Oops. Okay. I know what you're talking about, though. Um, see, the thing is, like, you can't really necessarily spoil it for me because I'm familiar with these studios like the one with the twins yeah I'm familiar with that studio's work I knew what was going to happen well you but knew but I was still excited and it was still fun to watch oh you knew did you well because they follow a <laughs> formula for their stuff yeah and this is you know because this, since this isn't like canon or whatever Disney just went here I want to see what you guys would do if then you had to answer yourself and I, I liked it like I liked the very first the first episode was neat yeah not my kind of art style because it's a little um I guess flashy for my taste it's a, it's a complex art style yep it looks simple when you look at it but then you're like let's just sit there and I put a lot of work put into you know even though it's mostly black and white, a lot of work went into the, all those uh, characters. Yeah. Sophie! Hey, Chris. Hey, everyone. Hey, Kim. I use contrast paints in all manner of ways. Yeah. I, I mean, it's... That's the fun of contrast. People seem to think that, you know, contrast can only do one thing, yet contrast oh, no, is a gateway to many abilities. Uh, I know it can be for multiple things. I just 
haven't seen a reason to really add the line to the bottom. Yeah. Like a lot of people are hyping up. Uh, well, well, people hyped up Dale seventy five like competition contract, and that went. Nobody talks about them anymore. Now it's Army Painter. That was their thing. Yeah. I see those videos. And people are like hyping that up, and I'm just like, I'm not that impressed. I mean, it's neat. I mean, it's a cheaper option for people that want something that does that, or they want to add filler to the toolbox. But I'm just sitting there, like, I don't really think a paint line needs all this hype. No. Especially when it's just doing something that somebody else has done. You know? We've talked about it many times where, you know, paint lines that don't really offer anything new. And so, like, what what is the point then? Now, if somebody was to come out with a color shift, I mean, color shift, I mean, um, no, with a color shift paint that worked perfectly when applied from a brush. Because the Turbo Dork does work when applied from a brush, but it, it works better when applied there. Yeah. I want somebody to get to the point with color shift paints where when I apply that with a brush, it's as if I airbrushed it because I don't mind airbrushing, but there's some times where I just want a little piece on the model to, you know, color shift. And when I go on there with a brush, it's not really noticeable. Yeah. So sometimes I'd have to sit there and spray the model all that color in that area, and then I have to sit there and take forever to color covering up the areas that didn't because the metallic flakes are still showing. I, I would, I would, uh, Turbo Dork was to come out with brush, I mean, it's cool now, but like a color shift line that was specifically for it or specifically worked well with a brush on some details, I would I that shit. Here. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure, uh, 100% yeah, sure yeah. what the process is for, yeah. you know, uh, like what goes into making a paint. Um, but I suspect that a paint to do what you're asking it to do. Oh, no, that's a, that's a, that's a large. Uh, well, I would suspect whatever the, the, the chemical is that they add that uh, makes the paint self-level would be hugely beneficial. I'm throwing that out there for free, so anybody who's paying attention... Yeah, um, Turbo Dork. <laughs> yeah, if Turbo Dork's listening to my jibber-jabber, I think the quality of the paint, whatever that additive is, that gives a paint the self-leveling quality, that's what they need to add to it to make it so that it, it's easier to brush onto a surface than what is currently out there. Because like what Molotow or, um, I think the style that has something in their primers does that where it kind of like levels out. Yeah. Like when you spray it and it might, it might like goop up somewhere, but if you like move the model, like if it's not like a serious, like build up, it will like level itself out and find somewhere else to like go. Which yeah. I, I like. Yeah, it's not a big deal because it's an airbrush primer so you're not laying on a bunch of it anyway. but it's just a nice little reassurance that if there's a little bit of a build up it, it'll, it'll uh, level out there's a little demon in the back of my brain saying push that brown quality a little further on the, uh, the icon on our belt but I think I'm going to resist that urge I think it's good as is it reads as MMM Sort of, right? I have to do that with myself. So I can make it pop. Yeah. I know, there's a little goblet in my brain going, no, no, you can go a little further. No, no, take it a little further. Go ahead. No, no, it'll be fine. Exactly. Then I'll do Then I'll do it, and then I'll fuck it up. And then... painting, painting a very large oil, because uh, I, did, I did my seven-layer workout, and I was doing a glazer, and um, I did two... So I was on my third glaze, and I, there's a spot that kind of pulled a little bit. It was like a little coffee stain, but it was somewhere that didn't fucking matter. Because when I put the when I would put the model together, you would barely see it unless you're looking at this specific angle from the bottom. So, but then I went to touch it with my brush, and um, I guess it was like halfway dry. So when my brush touched it, 
the paint clinging to the brush when I lifted my brush up. It uh, pulled the paint with it. Uh, yeah, that's annoying. Well, I learned the hard way. <laughs> then I had to strip that whole model. Giant freaking patch that you could see like all the way down to the primer. It was hot. Damn. All right. Normally I wouldn't strip, but that was like enough of a, a boo boo. I was like, oh. Next, I think. I don't know. So many little things here that I'm, I'm at this stage now where there's just a lot of little details to finish off. I'm thinking like the plunger could use a little bit of scratches, I think, on its surface just to, you know, give it some wear and tear. Yeah. All right, the, the debt cord. What should the debt cord be? Because I got the debt cord running from the plunger, and I also, it looks like she's supposed Black to have like a yellow? spool of it. What's that? Black and yellow. Black All and yellow? Level. Oh, like hazard line kind of thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I suppose we could do that. It's gonna be kind of hard though on this on the spool though. Uh, where's the spool? Uh, on her backpack. Oh, uh, is the spool textured? Um, not really. I could play it off as different wire then. Yeah, maybe. It is a different thickness. Uh, I just know the, or I can see the texture from the uh the, the plunger, the deck cord on the plunger. Yeah. Yeah, it, it definitely has a texture. But I'm wondering if it's supposed to be like like this stuff, but like, you know, wrapped up kind of thing. I don't know. I don't know explosives, so I'm not going to try and logic that out. We'll just do it fucking yellow. <laughs> and if we need to add black, we'll add black. Legion Miniatures. Visions was great. I hope they do another season. Yeah, I enjoyed it. Um, I think I think they should do more stuff like that. Just kind of random one-offs and you know, just explore ideas within I the like source. It. I like it, but then I'm running into the problem now. It's like I want more of the character that I liked in Visions. And I'm like, it's not going to happen. Yeah. It's like one -off thing. It's like, I want more. <laughs> yeah. I hear you. I want to know where this person went. Who knows, though, if they revisit Visions, who knows, they might ask one of the studios to come back and revisit their characters. Who knows? Yeah. There were a few I thought were, like, kind of silly, but I still enjoyed them. Yeah, well, it's anime. I mean, you, you gotta you gotta expect a little bit of whimsy in it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm familiar with all the studios. We're just sitting there, like the one that I'm thinking about. You might, you might know which one I'm talking about. It's just like really silly. The music one. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I liked it though. It was funny. Yeah. And it was fun. <laughs> it was just like it was silly. That's all I heard. I had that problem with a lot of things, though, because uh, Halo did similar, where they, uh, like Microsoft or Bungie, because it was still when Bungie had Halo IP, and we were still part of Microsoft or whatever, they went to some studios in Japan where, like, make Halo stories, and I was like, I like these so much, but I will never learn anything else about these characters, because they're one-off shows done by a studio, by a um, Japanese studio. It's like that with a lot of things. I had that problem with like Star Wars games and stuff too, where they were never, you know, one of the name changes, but there's always a character that I'm like, that character's interesting. I wish there would be more of it. Yeah, I think it's the last episode of it that you. I think you'll have you'll have that feeling as well. 
I'm already having enough beer. <laughs> the wine. I thought that character's design was really cool. Interesting. He obviously had a story. He, um, they tried giving you glimpses of it in the, uh, I think, I think these are like 20 to 30 minutes long shows. So they tried to give you a glimpse of this character's story previous to what was going on in the show. And I was like, this is interesting. I want to know more about this character. Right. And um, I have seen the trailers, so there's probably one or two more. Yeah, there's a few of them. The one that uh, has that Astro Boy style, and it's about the droid. Um, I think that's the shortest one I was looking at. That one's only like 12 minutes long. Yeah, that one, um, it raises an interesting question that I don't think Star Wars has really addressed in the uh, in the universe of Star Wars. What's that? Sentience of the droid? No, no. That is that seems well established as far as like droids are concerned, right? No, no. It you got to watch the episode. I don't want to. I don't want to ruin it for you. Oh no, I know. Uh, I just understand that he's obviously a robot because he literally looks like Astro Boy. <laughs> yeah, he's he's definitely he's definitely Astro Boy. Astro Boy inspired character. Yeah. yeah, but that one raised, like I said, raises an interesting question within Star Wars, and I don't think that's ever been addressed. I mean, I'm not that steeped in all the extra um, material of Star Wars, so I don't know, maybe there was like a, a comic about it or anything like that, but yeah. <clears throat> Just interesting. That's all. I am kind of hoping that there is more vision series. Well, it says season one, so my first thought is going to be Might not be the same studio, but I guess they're just waiting to see, because Visions is it's not super new. It's like, what, uh, when did it come out? I want to say it's like six months ago or something. Yeah, September 2021. <coughs> this episode aired. And it's gotten... A lot of people are like, so maybe they'll make a season two. Yeah. I think uh, opening it up to other studios, um, you know, not just Japanese anime, but like, you know, other animation studios uh, would be cool. Just for them to just do like little one-off shorts, just explore different ideas and, you know, just fun. Because you never know what, what comes out of it, right? You don't know the next a great idea that involving a Star Wars character or a scenario or whatever come out of one of these crazy ass uh, animation stories. You just never know. But that's the fun of, you know, exploring these ideas. Letting them breathe. Explore different areas. Using a little steel engine drab for this rocky outcrop thing on her face. Just give it a nice little base coat. Just a little. Bee, 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 bee. Kim, I got the instant potion paints from Scale Color. When I talk about contrast, I am including them. And the once for war colors, I'm also going to pick up the speed paints from Army Painter. Interesting. I think it'd be interesting just to see comparative, uh, how they stack up next to each other kind of thing, as far as like saturation and, you know, intensity of color. We were talking about it earlier on Discord, you know, it's when you see these videos and they're comparing paint lines and stuff like that, you know, they don't really do a proper comparison. They don't really stack up the colors properly next to each other and, you know, test them the way paint companies test them. You know, checking the light fastness and the coverage and, you know. 
And then, of course, when everybody talks about, you know, the pigment of the paint, this is really pigmented. This is not. And there is a way to check for that, but nobody does it. This is kind of interesting. Basically, I'm saying it's largely pointless. <laughs> Are you watching that episode right now, Boop? No. Oh. <laughs> you went quiet, so I thought maybe you, you tuned out for a bit. <laughs> Concentrate. Give that a moment to dry. Take a sip of ginger ale. In case anybody was wondering what I'm drinking. Or gave a shit. Sure, you're drinking ginger ale. Yeah, who said you do? <laughs> <laughs> I'm drinking Canada dry ginger ale the best kind of ginger ale. I've drank like sweat Schweppes and shit like that. I don't really care for it. Kind of dry has got a much, I don't know, a lot of flavor. You can really taste the ginger. <clears throat> I think you're just hated. Because it appeals to 10 people? Yes. <laughs> you made the 10 person joke this time. <laughs> <coughs> All right, just for gigglies, let's. What color would you shade that rock? The rock that she's got her foot up on? To differentiate it from the brown of her boot so it doesn't get lost. I'm gonna go with a dark brown, but I don't think so. I think I wanna go with something different. Well, what did you use to shade her boot? Uh, Saigua okay. brown? What's that? So did you use a dark brown for her boot? Yeah, I think it was Saigua. So maybe red? A red, a yeah. Brown? Like a, uh, like a almost clay brown? Yeah, a red would actually be pretty good play nicely with the, the all the green of the cloak like uh, uh, basically the whole figure really yeah like a like a clay brown like oh not not quite terracotta but yeah i got i i got you yeah a red i, I like it I'm, I'm gonna run with it i like it uh I let's go like with clear. the base will be like an earthy color but it won't be like you know her feet won't blend in back into the base yeah i hear you 
I'm thinking of contrast thinned out. Uh, what the fuck is that color? Flesh carrot is red. Thinned out. We'll build. We'll slowly build up to it, and we'll see what what happens. We're just gonna see what happens. I like the idea, and we're gonna see what happens. Now, we could have just as easily mixed probably Mephiston Red into the, what is it? Steel Legion Drab. But this way is more fun because that way we can build into effects rather than kind of just commit to it right away and then not like it, you know? <clears throat> Uh, ba -dum -bum -bum. Sophie, have you chosen the content for your videos you're making next week? Have I chosen? Um, well, I don't choose the content. The content chooses me. <laughs> um, well, I mean, yeah, I, I was expecting something, but there's a lot of delays in my area, so uh, I have not received what I'm expecting, so... That's all I can say. Legion miniatures. A burgundy or purple could work for the rock. Yes. I was thinking of the purple as well. I was thinking uh, quickly of Shyish purple. I was thinking that would actually be kind of fun. Uh, also, I was thinking of Leviathan blue. Doing a blue in there. Just to change the color of the rock a bit. and Because I didn't want to go with green. Because there's already so much green on the figure already. And I think the red, just a slight push towards red in the brown of the rock, I think would be a lot of fun. And that way it can build to a darker red in its recesses. And because it's a contrast, when it builds up and layers up on top of each other, it just gets dark. It doesn't really, um, like an opaque color, read back a lot of red. Like if I took just pure Mephiston red, broke it into a shade wash, it would just go Mephiston red in the recesses and it wouldn't get really dark. It would just get Mephiston red. Whereas using the contrast, it'll get dark as it gets into the recesses, which is why I want to use the contrast for this. Um, ba -dum -bum -bum. Kim, when I'm airbrushing hair, am I then hairbrushing? Fuck, that's a dead fucking joke if I ever heard one. Come on, Kim. Come on, man. All right, we're going to grab a nice little healthy amount onto our brush. Let's find a little spot on our palette. Yeah, we'll do that. And we'll get some medium. Nope, we'll get some contrast medium. Oh, i got to give this a shake. It's been a while. Yeah, see how you can see it? It's layer. Oh, you can't really see there. There we go. You can kind of see it there. It's a little thick. So you got to give it a mix. Even mediums need a mix. And there we go. Nice and clean. Trap is clean. What movie? What movie is that from? What? Oh, fuck. Never mind. I was just saying. <laughs> we'll see if anybody can get that reference. Flesh Terror's Red is just a fantastic color. You know why it's a fantastic color? Because it looks like blood. <laughs> blood. Kim, Fisting Red is one of the better Citadel colors. <laughs> fisting Red? Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Kim's, go Kim's all in on the fucking references today. <laughs> Gonna grab a nice, healthy amount of water. Just thin that down a little bit more. Like I said, I want this really, really thin, and I want to slowly build up to the desired result. Hence all the thinning. Let's give it a shot. Let's see what we get. Uh, we'll start right here. Oh, hate it. No, I'm just kidding. Yes. I think just the slight tint is all that's needed. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not 
not gonna lie, I'm, in, I'm intrigued by this, this look. I don't want too much red. I just want it in the recesses a bit. Yeah, see how it definitely looks different than the backpack, right? Just with that slight little red shift in it. That's what I want. I don't want the browns to look the same. I don't want the, you know, the uh, the rock to look like the brown or anything like that. And I want these things to be slightly different. I'll try not to hit some of these spots in there. Gonna go watch that episode. Uh, yeah. Go watch you that episode. Okay, well, wash your hands. Pedro, could I have a coffee break? Just don't forget to wash your hands, man. I like washing. <laughs> <laughs> Even now, like I started getting the hand soap that smelled really good. <laughs> like sometimes I might just go in the fucking bathroom. <laughs> into like the bathroom or over to like the kitchen sink and wash my hands <laughs> that's good staying clean is a good habit okay yeah I kind of like that once it dries it and calms down it, it definitely recesses and it doesn't look quite as crazy with the red but I kind of like that. Yeah, we'll do another layering in a sec. But I kind of like that look. Now the tricky part is going to be um, making the base match. So that's why it's kind of fun when I record these things because then at least I have a visual record of, of what I went through to get a particular look on a figure. Sophie, Ghostbusters. Yep, very good. Sophie, you win. You win the prize. You win the prize today, Sophie. What's the prize? Um, my undying respect. There we go. Well, maybe not undying. Just for today, you have my respect. <laughs> that sounds awful. <laughs> that sounds kind of like a dick thing to say. <laughs> The light is green, the trap is clean. Yep, there we go. <laughs> See, Sophie knows what's going on. I don't know what the rest of you clowns were quiet about. <laughs> Bunch of plugs. <laughs> yeah, I definitely like that. Just that little push towards red in the recesses and stuff. I like that. It almost looks like, um, you know, you get out into like the Grand Canyon and such. How you have that really almost red, pure red rock. Yeah, that's what that reminds me of. I like it. And just that subtle little shift makes the green just look a little bit more green. So imagine the whole base once that's in place. Yeah. Yeah. I likey. Me likey. Me likey. Let's grab a little bit more. We're going to do some deliberate placement of color. Basically, we're just going to push a little bit darker values down on the facets here. Just like so. I don't really think it's a little too much, but whatever. Whatever. I mean, once we start putting highlight colors back on top of this, it's going to, it's going to push quite a bit. I'm just going to push the color down. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, 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 dun. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah. There's a little too much here. Pull some of that out. There we go. Just a little bit. probably sat a little too long I'll probably end up with little tide marks and such so we'll let it be we'll let it breathe yeah I already did that there oops yeah I kind of 
don't like that. Not going to lie. Because otherwise, yeah, I would just lie about it and go, yeah, you know what? I think it looks great. around the rope or debt cord whatever the hell it is yeah I like that it's a little bright there in the front that's because it's still wet the back side is starting to dry you can see it doesn't look quite as intense once it dries which is what we want. Yeah, I like it. As far as like creating separation, I like that. Now the tricky part is gonna be doing the base and making that kind of match up. It's not gonna be that tricky, but you know what I mean. Now, uh, let's find somewhere else to play with <clears throat> so many little details you know what that stick of dynamite still bothering me let's okay just had an idea let's take uh, do I still have any on my palette yes I do let's take a little bit of Bugman's glow even that mixture I'm gonna take the remainder I'm going to mix, actually, no, yeah, I'll just grab some of this color, mix that in. Let's take just a little bit of the blood red contrast, and let's push it down. Yeah. I think one more little scoop, I don't know if you guys can see what color I'm making there, but that's uh, right around, yeah, right there, you can kind of see it in the camera. Yeah, I'm gonna grab just a little bit more Mephiston red or Flesh Terror's red. Okay, maybe a little more. <laughs> but yeah, we're gonna go with this flesh color for this. Grab quite a bit this time. What the ratio is, I could not tell you. If anything, if I was gonna suspect what color I'm doing, I would say it is closer to like a 50 50 type of mix and this is just for the stick of dynamite on her belt i know we're we're getting really finicky about a little stick of dynamite on her belt but this is where my brain goes yeah i just didn't really care for how intensely red this was and yeah now it feels a little bit more logical that this is a stick of dynamite it's got that slightly red hue but it also has that slight push towards brown as well and yeah yeah i don't yeah i like that a lot better it still reads as kind of red but it's not as you know bright red as before I like that better. It's not as intense. Yep, me likey. And in fact, I'm going to base coat the um, the explosives themselves. The dynamite right here on the base. I'm going to base coat that with this color right now. Do-do-do-do-do. I'm 
surprised nobody jumped in with a hey, hey. Remember. Oh, thank heavens, Boop. I was so lonely without you. How great I am to feel without you near Boop. <laughs> <laughs> Could be. Could be. If that's the case, I have to put you on the payroll. Might have to, anyway. Yeah, where's my tribute? <laughs> on the diver. Oh, fuck, I got your fucking tribute. <laughs> <laughs> where's my tribute? I'm surprised nobody's told Bob of that one in, in the show. What? Yeah, I've got your fucking tribute. Oh, right, there's no swearing in Star Wars. I might shoot him. <laughs> All these, like, side shows, like, side projects that, uh, have been going on for Star Wars stuff have been more excited than, like, the three main movies. movies. Yeah, the three last movies? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not talking about... Solo was okay. Rogue One was neat. And I would say... I mean, it wasn't, like, an amazing movie because uh, a lot of people... A lot of people go... I mean, yeah, I agree with the opinion. It's probably the better of the new movies. But uh, I find it interesting. A lot of people don't remember the names of characters from Rogue One. Well, what's the point of remembering people who are no longer around anyway? <laughs> it's like a lot of people remember like Jin Erso. Like that's her name. Yeah. Got a little calculator on the front, I feel like boop beep boop beep boop. Beep boop beep boop beep beep boop beep boop beep. <clears throat> yeah, the, the the newer movies, they are um, they are lacking. And well, I raised the question. Even though Rogue One was an enjoyable watch, is it since people can't remember the name of characters? Is it just a forgettable movie? <laughs> Well, how much impact did the character have is really the question, right? Because, yeah, nobody seems to remember her name. Now, when you say nobody, are we talking about the characters in the show or are we talking about actual people? Talk about people who go into great movies. Oh, yeah. I mean, when you're comparing it to, I mean, the three main ones, yeah, it's a better movie, but I'm like, is it, is it a, a great movie? Because the other ones just are so bad, or is it a great movie that on its own leg is a great movie? Yeah. So kind of thing. Yeah. The question I'm raising. Right, because if it was so much better, we'd all be saying, "Yeah, Jen Erso's a fucking hero in Star Wars, and the yeah. role she plays like, is." People hardly ever remember her name. Yeah. And I can't pronounce. The staff guy, blind dude. It's like Kim G or something. I can't pronounce it. Yeah, honestly, I can't remember. The only the only character I remember from Rogue One, as far as names are concerned, is the droid K two S O. Yeah, most people just remember the droid's name. That's why I said, except for the droid, can you name the character? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's kind of kind of funny. Yeah, I could do Jin Erso and. Um, Oh, her Chim dad. Chim Wee. I'm going to have to look at how you pronounce it. And the dad. Galen. Galen Urso. Oh, and Director Krennic. Well, now you're starting to remember him. Oh, well, Shiro. Yeah, that's... Shiro Imwee. There we go. <laughs> now the last name. <laughs> Shiro Imwee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, for people. 
Aside from the droid, a lot of people like really struggle with just naming one of the droids. Yeah. That is kind of interesting. And then that raises the question, were we just looking through that that uh, that movie through, not nostalgia, because I know like, people like say right through the glasses or like nostalgia, but were we just looking at that movie and comparing it to the main three that just were hot messes? Right. I feel bad for that one actor that played uh, Rose. She got so much hate. Uh, it was like she wasn't the one who writ- wrote the script. She was just an actor. She was just played paid to play the character. She didn't write the script for shit. Yeah, exactly. No, and it's that kind of toxicity. I don't understand either because I mean, like, like imagine the poor guy who played Jar Jar, or the kid who played Anakin. You know, they were just there to, to play the script. They're yeah, just they're actors. They're not the writers. Yeah, they didn't fucking they didn't make it. They didn't make those choices. They were just. But they're the ones who cut the slack. Yeah. Which is crazy. Because I'm going to be honest. I mean, yeah, the writers are credited in the credits, but how many people. I mean, people might skip through the credits for, like, the little teasers at the end of, like, Marvel movies and shit. People aren't fucking reading them. <laughs> Doesn't seem like it sometimes, no. I'm gonna take a break for 40k and I'm just gonna cause uh Mandalorian Book of Boba Visions um I rewatched the old Clone Wars the old one 2000 and like the 2D one one yeah the 2D one and I just like it's rekindled my wanting to do Star Wars related stuff sad I can't say the movies did that but yeah. Other than rewatching the old classics, right? Yeah. I mean, I'll even rewatch the prequels, and sometimes I'll watch them in chronological order, and sometimes I'll watch them in like four, five, then flashback one, two, three, and then six. Yeah. But that's the, that's the way I like to watch it. The machete order. I like the or- that order. Which is why but, it makes uh, the newer films a little bit more painful. Because the way that order lays out how things break down, as far as this overall story is concerned, it, it makes those newer three newer films feel way more inconsistent. <clears throat> when you watch it four, five, then two, three, and then six, it makes the whole thing feel very cohesive. You drop out, obviously, episode one because it's really just, it's not necessary. Even, you could argue, two. Watch it, but. but yeah, I like I like watching Star Wars in that order if you want to really get, you know, the full, the full sense of the overall arcing plot, right? That makes sense to me. I will admit one episode gets a lot of flack for good reason but I will still watch it um I I can't remember the last time I've watched it I watched I watched this the episodes one through six once a year we'll say Just like I'll watch Lord of the Rings once a year. Right. I usually just pick a day where it's like really, really shitty outside. There's nothing to do around the house. I just bed out and play snacks and shit on the couch. Like, yep, let's go. (laughs) Yeah. Kind of the same way myself. I won't say, like, the prequels are my favorite, but unlike other people, I can actually tolerate their existence and sit there and watch it all three of them. Oh, I mean, I like part three. Part three is good. Part two is all right. It's got, you know, decent moments in it and stuff, but, yeah. Um, part one, though, 
largely unnecessary as far as the overall story is concerned. Uh, realistically, part three should have been the, the, the trilogy. That the whole thing, the way it all develops. <clears throat> Did we really need, you know, all the Palpatine stuff? Not really. The story, because Star Wars really is about the rise and fall of Anakin Skywalker. Do we really need all the silliness as far as, you know, having to explain the Force and what makes the Force and all that? Did we really need that explained to us? Not really. It wasn't important to the overall story. I think what does it for me in episode one and the reason I still watch it is because I just like sound effects for the Trade Federation. <laughs> right. And I like the scene the battle droids even though they are kind of like a little bit cheap did you see there's a, a video of somebody who remastered that uh, initial sequence in episode one using the unreal engine you mean in, in the space station no no uh the, w before the big battle on naboo Oh, you know where all, where all the droids? Where the droids are coming out on the raft. Right now. Yeah. I what they're called. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Somebody redid that scene in Unreal, and it looks better than what we got twenty some years ago. And understandably, of course, because it was twenty years ago. Technology has come a little bit ways. Oh, excuse me. Yeah, uh, I can't remember what the hell it's called. I used to have a Lego version of that droid character. I forget carrier. I forget what it was called. Ooh, this is cool. <laughs> it looks pretty good, eh? Yeah. I mean, granted, the version of Unreal Engine they're um. The, the game engine they're using is it? I believe it's Unreal Five engine or whatever. Yeah, it's it's obviously a newer uh, modeling program than uh, what they had. Yeah. Was, what two that really early two thousands late nineties. Late nineties was episode one. Ask ask Gim to tell you his episode one story. Next time you, you, you see him online or something, just give him, ask him. Um, 1999. Yeah. yeah. I was six years old. I remember seeing that. Yeah, Gim's got, a, Gim's got a funny story about that one. It's not hilarious or anything, but it's interesting. would it not be a funny story oh it's interesting and just to show how dedicated a fan he is I think I feel like I've asked him this story did he like wait out in line for a long period of time for it yeah yeah, yeah now I've heard this story yeah yeah, yeah. I want to say it was like damn near two days but okay. I'm sure. It, it, I'm sure as he retells the story, it probably becomes more along the lines of "I was there for a week in the rain and the weathers and the elements," and you know, it just as stories get embellished, like, right? Uh, I had to walk two miles and eight feet of snow. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's, it's like everybody's parents give that story, and it's like that's not how you went to school. I know how you went to the school. Yeah. You went to school in the eighties. It wasn't that much. <laughs> <laughs> My parents used to be that, and I was like, I know when you went to school. I know where yep. grandparents still live in the same house. And you, <laughs> that, and you went to school. I know how far away it was. I know the bus still was about to pick you up. You didn't fall.
Master as a saber fight between Vader and Kenobi might be cool, but um, I'm gonna be honest, that wasn't really a fight. Like Kenobi carried him tw- twice, and then was like, "I'm gonna become a Force ghost." <laughs> <laughs> you mean that reimagined scene? Is that what you're talking about? Uh, that's what Kenobi fight. I haven't seen the this reimagined scene that you're talking about, but I was gonna say there, there wasn't much of a fight. It was more like, you know. That um, Obi Wan like carries Vader like twice, and then he's like, "I'm gonna become a Force ghost." Then he just like you know picks the saber up and he lets Vader take a swing at him. Then he like poops fantasy. Yeah. Um, there's a reimagining of that scene that somebody did. It's really really good. You should check that out. I think it's called SC Reimagined, something like that. I'm sure a quick search you'll find it. It's really good. Yep, I see it. Really cool fight. Yeah. Looking at it. So they draw it out into like an actual like fight fight. Yeah. It's really good. It's well done. I mean, is it, you know, perfect movie quality? Eh, not really, but it's a really good jumping off point for, you know, if uh, somebody at Lucas wanted to, uh, you know, pull a George Lucas and edit the fucking scene make, make it so Han didn't shoot first <laughs> yeah yeah exactly See, I like I like the Han shooting first cause that kinda plays into the he's a uh, cause he is an owl yeah well it made more he, sense he might be a good he might be a quote unquote good guy or at least not you know a bad guy but he is an outlaw His he has self preservation like top priority well he is a criminal and he's, he's a, that's what I was getting at. He's a criminal. He might not be, you know, like, mustache growing evil, but at the end of the day, he's an outlaw. You know, he's looking out for... At that point in the movie, he's looking out for himself. So I'm like, I would have just kept the... Yeah. The, him shooting first. Because it was quite obvious. It was painfully obvious Greedo was just going to fucking waste him, so... Yeah. And why they changed that, I'm not sure. Like, what... I've heard so many theories like they wanted to make him more heroic and all that and I was just like I don't know I just think George Lucas because there at one point it was like the original one was Han shot first and they wanted to do Greedo shot first and then like they finalized going on them just shooting at the sky yeah it doesn't make a lot of sense and I think it, it's it was better when Han shot first because it is it makes it makes the arc of Han becoming a good guy much more meaningful. Not a good guy than just guy for the guy looking out. Nope. Well, I mean, by the by the time we get to Return of the Jedi, he's a good guy. He's yeah. fighting for the rebels. He's a hero, right? That's that's what I mean. Like he's a good guy in that sense yeah. that he's he's on the right side. He's, he's fighting the good fight. Yeah. Like out the right. He's not selfish. That's the whole point. In obviously, even in the first movie, because they meet him. And he's this, you know, he's a skeevy criminal. But then at the end of the film, you know, he t- does take his payment, but he does come back and do the right thing and back up his friend. And so, you know, that's where you get a, a more complete picture of the character, a story arc for the character, right? And then after the Death Star destroyed, he doesn't fucking think of I should pay my debt off to fucking Jabba. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He, yeah, he welches on that debt. He waits until he starts getting run-ins with the bounty hunters to be like, <laughs> oh, well, maybe I should go pay. Because in five, when Hoth face is getting is like when he's like initially trying to leave Hoth, he mentions to Leia that they had a run-in with a bounty hunter in Ordnance Hell. Yeah. And <laughs> so like he's already on Jabba's shit list at this point. It's like you have all of the time. Well, because the, the lesson the lesson that Han is teaching at that moment is procrastination is bad. <laughs> <laughs> pay your fucking bills, you know. Pay your debts. Yeah, pay your debts. Especially when it's fucking 
<laughs> exactly. When there's big fat green mo- mobsters after you, you pay your debt. To be fair, though, um, without spoiling anything related to Boba Fett at the moment, Jabba's a fucking troll. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to spoil anything, but Jabba's a little like warrior word, petty ass. So. <laughs> I mean, he's a hut, so. Like hut hut? Hut hut? He's a hut. Hut hut. Blue 42, blue 42, hut, hut. I know what you're doing. <laughs> I know what you're doing. I know what you're doing. I knew what you were doing. I don't want to spoil it. Because you haven't read the comic either. So I know. Oh, I haven't I haven't read the shit you've read? Is that what you're saying? No, because we discussed this yesterday. I don't think you've read the comic yet. Boop. Are you are you looking at the screen right now? Yes. He has the comic. If you want to pull it out. No. Uh, <laughs> there. Uh, here's your oh, fucking. Yeah, yeah. Here's your fucking comic. I mean, it's painfully obvious, but uh, Jabba is a little fucking. Oh, he's a big fucking asshole. Well, yeah, he's a mobster. Like a petty, a petty. Nah, he's just not an asshole. He's fucking. So um. Yeah. Who people watch this book with Boba? Yeah, and 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 Boba Fett. Yeah, like Boba Fett is right. You know, he's right. He's right. But he's also, uh, in my eyes, uh, vindicated in what he's doing because uh, of what happened, you know, how big he was. Right. Uh, Sophie, I thought Rogue One was gold, bridging the movie between episodes three and four. Didn't really like Solo, but I'm not a huge Star Wars fan. Anyway, I just watched them at times. Yeah. Um, yeah, Rogue One, um, I don't know about bridging the gap between three and four. There's a lot of time. Uh, that is um, jumped over between three and four. Rogue One really only tells you like the couple of days before episodes. Well, the thing is, is like Rogue One, um, they basically made that to explain what people called a quote unquote plot hole, right? And well, yeah, and, prior and, to that, you had to have played a video game. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, it, yeah, so, you know, it, it's... But, I mean, it, it was great that they did it. And, you know, I mean, like, it had some really great scenes. It has, like, one of the best Darth Vader scenes at the end, you know. Yeah. Spoiler for anybody who's not watched Rogue One. If you've not watched Rogue One and you're listening to me, I mean, uh, I don't know what page you're on, but, yeah. But, as, yeah, as far as, like, filling the gap between three and four, there's a lot of space there. And there's a lot of room to tell stories because it is a kind of an interesting... Uh, point in you know the lore of Star Wars because you know there's a lot of room between how do they switch from being the Republic and having stormtrooper or uh, clone troopers to becoming the Empire and what happened to all those troopers what happened you know and to transition into uh, being stormtroopers and just kind of recruiting people and you know that kind of shit it, it looks like they're starting to do that with Bad Batch Kind of, yeah. But I, prior to that, you know, pre Disney lore, it was just the clone troopers that they found, they did their jobs. Yeah, exactly. And it's you know, like, I, I guess that's fine. But you know, I think I'd like a little bit more flesh on those it's, on those bones. Bad match. I want to touch on that though. Definitely want to point to eventually switch, switch or supplemented by uh, bomb. Yeah. You know what, Boop? That was a good call on that red, on the rock. I like it. I like it a lot. As far as Solo goes with the movie, I mean, I had fun watching it. Uh, I didn't really think it was a necessary movie. No, shit no. They could have done something a little bit different with that. And mm-hmm. I think better as well. It, it felt very isolated. Because none of these characters that he's interacted with, you will ever, ever see again. Right. Well, it, we, we it, might it see What's Her Nuts, but yeah. Okay, we might see her. Yeah. Her, it's, it's, you know what, the movie's like, what, three, four years old now? So, uh, you know, kind of to spoiler game. His first love interest 
make play the role, but in a future movie or some future like show or something. But I doubt it. <laughs> um, I mean, we we get references, obviously, because well, again, spoiler. Um, Darth Darth Maul is in charge of the crime syndicate. The um, the fuck are they called? The Red Crimson Dawn or some shit. Something like that. Yeah. Anyway, you know she Different might time. she might come back in, and you know it's it's only because of Clone Wars that we know what the Pikes are and you know. I think that they might bring her back in in like a TV show, like shit they might show up in. Because the syndicate she works for is a syndicate that's hard enough to have her Yeah, yeah. Um, I think they're a replacement to the Black Sun Syndicate, who was a, what, back when Dark Horse Comics did Star Wars comics, that was like the big crime family that rivaled the Hutt. Right. This Crimson, I think it's just called Crimson, could be wrong, it's Crimson Sun. They're basically the replacement. Black Sun. Right. And, um, they could play a role. I mean, they might show up in the fucking book of Boba, but who the fuck knows? Right. Well, and see, that that's the thing is, like, I was kind of, um, speculating that in Bad Batch, because it felt like we were touching base with a lot of very familiar bounty hunters. And I thought that that was going to be more of a setup for Book of Boba as far as, you know, reintroducing us to a lot of these uh, familiar little faces that we, you know, have not gotten much screen time. And in Book of Boba, we were going to get more of that. But so far, the the show really is more concentrated on focusing on who, Book, who Boba Fett is right now. Not so much like what his past self was. We get the idea that obviously he's had a change of heart of where he wants to be or who he wants to be. And, you know, he um, he's not the hunter anymore. Right? He basically wants to be, you know, the head of his own crime family. Spoiler. Not really a spoiler because that's like painfully obvious <laughs> is it in the in the show like the opening minutes it's kind of like painfully obvious that he wants to be a you know i don't know what's painfully obvious anymore because i see so many videos of people wanting things at endings explained to them so and people tune in well, for that people shit people will make a video about anything like, <laughs> true videos on like how the book of boba is ruining boba fett as a character even though boba fett as a character to Disney taking the reins was fucking all over the place. Right. Like, here's this badass bounty hunter. Here's this incompetent like fucking fool. <laughs> like everywhere. Yeah. There's. No, it's. I mean, there's all... It's. I'm not gonna say. Sorry. <laughs> you go first. Yeah. No, go ahead. Boop. Right, um, I'm not gonna say there's not a lot of cooks in the kitchen with Disney. I mean it's. There are a lot of cooks in the kitchen, but there is somebody somewhere that's going, that's taking the role of head chef. Unlike prior, where George Lucas just kind of let people do whatever the fuck they want. Or at least it felt like he let them do whatever the fuck they want. Because there's so many instances in book stuff where, like, people like Bubble Fett, Django Fett, all these people, like, characters that people want to put their, like, these self images on because they're not the elaborate characters they're introduced in the movie and they get, like, five minutes. Yeah. Every time a book comes out by these characters, the author's interpretation, like, half the time it conflicts with another book that has that character. Yeah, and you see that all the time when these you get these series and these franchises and books and stuff and comics. Yeah. You see it all the time. There's not too many cooks in the kitchen with Disney, but at least it is a guiding light that's kind of like, this is... You can't necessarily do exactly everything you want because everything kind of has to at least there might be some overlap in terms of the lore but it's not 
all over the place like it was with the EU prior to the record. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of dum dums out there. There's a lot of dum dums out there. And I'm sorry, but if you're not following the conversation, you might be a dum dum. Set. Yes. Yeah. Has comic books. I think I would not doubt. I want to put money on it, but I would not doubt if she gets her own fucking series too. I could see it. And because now here, here's the like you know the new trilogy follows that. So. Yeah. Well, and and it's obvious because she's she's it looks like she's wearing Beskar, and she has kind of a Mandalorian like helmet, right? And, you know, now here's here's the crazy idea I've had. Now, this is just a wild theory, but um, I suspect uh, Omega is somehow linked to Phasma. She either is Phasma or or she is like a clone of, of Omega. Oh, yes. Yeah, from back. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. Never mind. I <laughs> yeah, Omega. Yeah, no, no. Yeah. Because because it feels like that character is somebody that they want to develop further, but whether or not we get like a live action version of her, who knows? Could be just as long a break from you know her animated self to getting a live action version of her, um, which would be interesting, I think. Um, because there's many different ways you could go about telling this, uh, telling stories about Omega, especially as she becomes older. Like, does she just choose like a normal kind of life or does she stay as, you know, a soldier for hire or, you know what I mean? Like, where does she go? And it's kind of like, uh, Ahsoka. Ahsoka, um, you know, we're introduced to her as, you know, she's a young, young girl and... You know, we watch her basically through what three different animated series into live action, and that's probably what I think what the first Clone War, like the CG Clone Wars, wasn't that oh three, oh four? The two D one, you mean? No, not the two D, because she's not in the two D. Was oh three? Oh, the two D was oh three. So the anime, the uh, the three D one was created a few years after Episode three. Was it? Okay. Either way. So we're talking about at least 10 to 15 years uh, gap between, you know, how they play out the character and then getting a live action iteration of it, right? Yeah, three, three years. 2008. Yeah, okay. So, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it'd be interesting. And I'm, I get the feeling that that's something that they want to do is they want to make Omega like the next Ahsoka where you know we, we're very very familiar with this character she's always been in the background and then you know they give her uh her own storylines in a, like a live action type format and kind of just basically shoehorn her in to the rest of star wars lore which essentially is what they did for ahsoka and yet ahsoka's characters is so so fun and you know you can argue Star Wars from Clone Wars to to Mandalorian that Ahsoka the story of Star Wars is the star story of Ahsoka as well because I'm looking forward to the new Ahsoka show that should be fun um I need to hit the washroom. I'll be right back. Entertain everybody, boop.
And the back. Oh. Yeah, sorry. Had to, uh, had to make pee pee. Well, I guess not technically make it. I'm, I'm, the body's constantly making it, so I had to evacuate. <laughs> in, case, in case you needed a blow by blow account of it. <laughs> right now I'm buying a MTG card because the because you're crazy the new character oh Star Wars character I like is basically a ninja Jedi <laughs> 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 and I'm like they have booster packs that are uh, only available currently on pre-orders that is just the ninjas from the new uh, release right I really like that character. <laughs> I'm just like, yes. Sophie! I'd watch episodes 1, 2, uh, then Clone Wars animated, then episode 3, then Solo Rogue One, episode 4, 2, 6, then 7 to 9. Oof! Man, that's a lot of watching. There's a re remastered saber fight between Vader and Kenobi from episode 4 on the time to, and I think on YouTube. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we were talking about that earlier. I don't know if she said that at the same time or what, but if anyway. I had the taste. I would watch all the Star Wars media in chronological order. Oof. But I don't have patience. Like chronological as far as story's concerned or uh, yeah, release? Like story, story is concerned. Oh, jeez. Yeah, you know. that's, that's a lot of work. But starting with 1, 2, Clone Wars, through, uh, I think, um, some of the Clone Wars episodes might take place, like, no, because 3 is kind of like really quick. Yeah. So it would just be one, two, Clone Wars, three, Rebels and Bad Batch. Right. So we get uh, Rogue One if I wanted to. We'll have to Mandalorian to the world. <laughs> it's a lot of fucking watching, man. Yeah, that, that is a lot, because there's like six seasons of Clone Wars, and there's a lot of episodes. And yeah. it's like movies. <laughs> like Clone Wars movies. Well, like the last four episodes of Clone Wars, that pretty much is a movie. And you can watch that right before watching episode three. Lines right up, you know. Legion. Saying, Go ahead. I was like, I'm not saying the version is better. I, I just personally like it because I like that much how well, I liked how the 2D uh, led us right into episode 3. Yeah, it, it went, dropped you right there. Yeah, I, I like that, how basically, because it also gives more context to Grievous's, um chest there? cold. Yeah, but, I'll be honest. I mean, I know Grievous killed some Jedi in the Clone Wars, but in the Clone Wars, he did not feel intimidating. Well... What's intimidating? He didn't feel like the big bad boogie that he was like putting out there. Well, because that's Palpatine's job. I mean, how, how do you get, how do you get more badass than what Palpatine's doing? He's he's un, he's taking over an entire republic. I mean, well, I get that, but you know, everybody's like, "Oh, General Grievous, we gotta stop him all this stuff." And, like he he's like, I I get it though, because Clone Wars started with Force Field. I don't know. It just felt kind of goofy. Yeah. Well, I mean, a lot of a lot of the characters feel goofy. I mean, goofiness is oh, part yeah, part I of the. Yeah, it was more aimed towards kids. Legion Ventures, yeah. episode one has a few ideas that just need a bit more follow through in two and three to make it all work. Stuff like Qui Gon Jinn changing dice rolls to only save Anakin, the Jedi in general being dismissive and manipulative towards others, which is a far cry from their heroic ideal. True, yeah. Huck, hey, after watching episode four, we watched the history of Boba Fett development and hadn't realized so much about him, but very cool development. Yeah. I mean, like, the, sh the Book of Boba show is it's not really, realistically, see, everybody's expectations were we were going to get like this what we expected of Boba Fett, whatever that was. But in fact, we're, 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 we're not dealing with the expectation. 
and we're we're dealing with him pivoting his identity and who he is and what he does yeah like so like for example if you thought he was a badass and he was you know shooting people up and or whatever you want to assume about him he's pivoting from that and he is becoming his own his own boss and his you know he's making his own story as it were Taking it this way is that Boba Fett had all the way up to the point he fell in dark by Lactic. He was a badass gunslinger, and his he was in the Sarlacc pit, pit for a good amount of time. Yeah, he wasn't down there for a day. Or two. Yeah, I, I I'm kind of curious to know like how long was he down there, or or how long after getting out. Was he with the Sand People? I would assume he's with the Sand People for quite a while. He's with the Sand People for quite a while, but he's also in Star Black Pit for, and I quote him, um, people who don't want to like hear this telling him, you can change your life a minute. <laughs> uh, he does say in the show, it was his last episode, that he was in the Sarlacc Pit for a few years. Was he? Yeah. Yeah, he, no, he says that. That he was in the pit for a few years. It's a long time. Yeah. So. There's that, and then the time is kind of up and shown. He obviously was in the Sarlacc pit. He got all those, like, tentacle brains or whatever. Like this is like Book of Boba's taking place like a good a good chunk of time after the uh, fall. Well, the Mandalorian movie even takes place quite a quite a few years after the fall of the sky. Yeah, because it it wasn't like the Death Star blew up and every all all the Imperial loyalists went into hiding like. Garrison still would have been holding out, you know. There would have still been, I would imagine, a large, like, Imperial presence on, like, the core worlds and stuff. Well, even imagine uh, what Coruscant would be like during the transition. You would assume it's a civil war at that point. Yeah. Just just well, on that planet. I mean, it was over in the middle of civil war. But, like, the Empire did not, like, immediately dissolve. As soon as the Death Star blew up, for instance, like it, it was a significant period of time before you know the New Republic was able to possess most of the areas from the Empire. It's not like you know overnight, because even in the Mandalorian, um, you know, the one character the uh, MMA fighter plays, mm -hmm. he was a New Republic shock trooper. It knew, implying that you know they were still fighting the Empire right. at the time after the Death Star. Yeah, Crimson Dawn, and it's Peter Stormare as Darth Maul, and it's no spoiler that he wants to be boss. It's in the trailer, right? I mean, yeah, you get you get the the sense that obviously that's where he wants to go with it. But in the last episode, he he makes it very clear to Fennec, um, you know, what his uh, intentions are, what he wants to achieve, and the life that he led before you know, doesn't matter anymore. <clears throat> so, even though some people will criticize 
that that idea that the Boba Fett show was going to be about Boba Fett being a badass, whatever that is. But because he is at this point of pivoting, you know, his life, you can still go back and tell stories about Boba Fett, you know, hunting down people and badass. and being a badass. Right, yeah, exactly. But we already kind of got that with The Mandalorian, right? He, it starts off that he's going around and hunting people and, you know, then of course it becomes basically uh, he's trying to uh, outrun you bounty hunters. Tell it, tell it, shape, you know, it's, it's basically like the first couple episodes where he's just doing normal bounty hunts and then, you know, color in the armor and the bow colors and, you know, that, that would have been blah, 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 because he is a bounty hunter. Right, exactly, yeah. That's that's exactly true. Like, could have just changed out the armor color, and it would have been Boba Fett, and you would have had your Boba Fett show about Boba Fett being Boba Fett. Like, it's it's really quite ridiculous, you know. A lot of people are just set in, in the sun because uh, they Disney could revisit younger Boba Fett and other material. Yep. It's not like I, they're just right now because they're going with their current timeline with Mandalorian and the two shows kind of find a little bit. Boba Fett and Mandalorian is old man Boba Fett. Yeah. And he's got different goals. He wasn't even in episode six. He wasn't. He wasn't like super old, but you know, he wasn't a spring chicken either. So. No. And he was a he was a seasoned man. So he was uh, not necessarily like a little little kid, but he was a type of teenager with uh, Clone Wars uh, boobies after the Clone, and then he's obviously aging when he shows up, you know, the material taking place after episode three. You get to, you get to return to the, you know, Revengers? No, Revengers was, was three. Return of the Jedi, I guess. So we get to episode six. Boba Fett might be in his, like, very, like, good late days. By the time you hit Return of the Jedi, Boba Fett should be in, almost in his 40s. Yeah, like late 30s, late 30s, early 40s, something like yeah. that. Yeah. You know, he looks better than a Sarlacc pit. It, 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 it really depends upon if you, you get a solid timeline of when Clone Wars occurs, Episode 3, and then the time between Episode Formation. 3 and 4. I mean, we can guess from episode two to episode three, it's about anywhere from five to ten years. It's it's quite a bit of time goes by. And then uh, by the time you get to episode four, well, it's, it's, it's at least 19, 18, 19 years. Yeah. Right? So quite a bit of time. And in episode two, Boba Fett is like, what, an eight, nine-year-old? Nine, maybe tops like 10. Yeah. So he's already that old by that point. And yeah. by the time um, episode 3 rolls around, well, he should still only be just a teenager. And then by the time episode 4 rolls around, yeah, he should be at least 20 years older, which would put him anywhere from 35 to 40. Depending on how, how time flows. So by the time Book of Boba is rolling around, that's another at least from episode four to episode six, you're looking at at least what, ten years of fighting going on from episode four to episode six? That's ten years. I didn't think it was that long. It's it's gotta be long. It it, it can't be one after the other. It can't be over the course well, of a weekend. One after the other, but I didn't think ten years because that's a long time for um, Jabba to be looking for Han Solo. Well, it's a big galaxy. True. I mean, a, a person could hide on Coruscant and never be found. Technically, because of how many levels it deep it goes. By the sounds of it, it goes damn near to the planet core of people. So, 
you know, I mean, like, again, the nothing's really hashed out. And then, of course, uh, Mandalorian is roughly taking place, like, five years after Episode 6. So the duration of Boba Fett from Episode 4 to The Mandalorian, it's got to be anywhere from 5 to... Uh, well, it's got to be more than 5 because 5 years from 6 to 10 uh, at Mandalorian. So you've got to be at least 10 years from Episode 4 to The Mandalorian. At least. Maybe more. Which would put Boba Fett as a really old dude. He'd be in his 60s, damn near. Which kind of jives because he is fairly old. And even um, the actress that plays Fennec, she's damn near 60. Like, in real life. Mm -hmm. And she don't look it. That woman takes care of herself. So, yeah, I mean, like, I don't know, like... um, if it's been, you know, confirmed, so to speak, what the time frame is from from episode to episode, really. Because they don't really give us, you know, timestamps, dates, right? At least in Star Trek, and they give us star dates. I'm looking up, and I guess the common, basing off of, like, other material, it's, like, about six years for the Galactic Civil War. Six years for a galactic civil war? That doesn't seem long enough. Like, from four to six, and people are just kind of putting this together between the movies and um, printed material, too. Yeah. But, I mean, it's not really over, because they're still fighting after the Death Star blows up. What is that detail? Does anybody know? What is that detail, that little bendy thing in behind his backpack? Or her backpack? What is that detail? Looks like a damn giant paperclip. It probably is a paperclip that the sculptor just used. Holy fuck, Matt, I had no idea you were f- in here. Holy shit. Scared the shit out of me. I, jo- I joined in and I'm like, oh, they're talking about fucking Boba Fett, or the book of Boba Fett. Which I'm still calling it. I'm probably gonna be wrong, but I, but I'm hoping. You're wrong. Yeah, you're wrong. Someone, I know what you're about to say. And you're someone wrong. betrays oh, him. Someone betrays him. And he kills and him. They throw him into the Sarlacc pit. Okay, that's yeah, what yeah, I'm you're hoping. Already. Okay, well, you're you're not watching the show, are you? Because I don't think that's gonna happen. I, I I'm I'm willing to be wrong. I just would find that very funny. Using uh, the comic book funny. There's like a, a 99% chance you're wrong. You know what? I'm still willing to take those odds. <laughs> so you're saying there's a chance. <laughs> well, I guess to be fair, he is half wrong. <laughs> well, I mean, well, judging by the last episode, I mean... Um, I'm half wrong, but I don't want to spoil anything for anybody. So I'm not going to say why I think he's half wrong. But... I think he's mostly wrong. But, okay, we're mostly wrong. But I could see, be mostly wrong. There are some nuances. <laughs> see, see, the problem is right now I'm too cheap to pay for Disney Plus. <sighs> anyway, I don't think just by watching the last episode, I don't think he'll end up back again in the Sarlacc pit. And I don't think the Sarlacc pit is a danger anymore. Now, if you watch the episode, you know why I say that. So, basically, Matt, the lesson here is don't make assumptions about shit that you have not witnessed. I mean, listen, I'm being like a speculator on Wall Street. I'm making assumptions of stuff I don't understand. Well, I mean... Yeah, Kim, exactly. 
It'll be like the news. I'll speculate on things that I just don't understand. It'll be great. <laughs> Not really. Cause it, um, because all it does is negatively impact you. Eh. <clears throat> Huck, hey, yep. But expecting more bad arse to come because you can't trust anyone and he, and to lead he will need to show a bit more of his bounty hunter power. I don't know if it's bounty hunter power, but it's definitely he's got a he's got definitely got to bust some heads. And in the last episode, he starts that process. I think it's it, because I think there's only what two or three more episodes left. So yeah, so like it's got to wrap up pretty soon, unless of course it's just gonna end on a fucking cliffhanger, uh, which cool. of which I fucking hate cliffhangers. They could because I I would imagine that there's gonna be a second. Yeah. <laughs> Legion. I also do a third season, Amanda. Yeah, Legion says he's definitely going to ride that rancor into battle. <laughs> yeah, well they tease that right, so you know, it's got to happen now. I'll be disappointed in the show if it doesn't have end on you know him riding into battle with that or something. <laughs> I like too how in that episode where he gets his his rancor spoiler, um, I like how they explain the relationship between the rancor and their owners and even the handlers. Because then it makes it more tragic in episode six when Luke kills the fucking Rancor. Yeah, and the boot dude, dude's just blubbering. And it's hilarious when you watch it. But then, because they add this little layer of, of context, it makes it a little bit more sad. <laughs> and you actually feel bad for that handler now because he's like, oh, my little baby's dead. You know, and it's like, and then it, make, it kind of makes Luke the asshole because... Yeah, Luke fucking <laughs> straight up killed that monster. Yeah, he killed he killed the fucking monster trying to fucking kill. Him. Well, and he and here's the other hilarious part. Like if you've watched uh, Bad Batch, you know what that Rancor's name is, right? So that Rancor had a name, had a personality, had a journey, had that handler who loved him. Or Dengar. And then. Right, and then, you know, um, the, the Rancor gets killed by some fucking kid in a black outfit. Some emo kid. The handler might not be yeah. named Dengar, but the actor that played the handler was the same actor that played Dengar. Cut. A little bit of trivia. Watch the Boba Fett documentary. <laughs> it's where Lucas talks about how he came up with the character, or how they came up with the character and shit. Um, now, now, did you watch all of Bad Batch? Huh? Did you watch all of Bad Batch? No, I'm working my way through it. Oh, okay. Then I'm not going to say anything. Like, Rancor having a name isn't really a spoiler. <laughs> no, I think that's like the first episode, isn't it? Yeah. it's. I've already gotten to that point. But... Yeah. <laughs> the actor who... A lot of the actors who played characters who you never saw in those days played other characters. Makes the sense. actor who played Bubble Fett originally played the Imperial officer who is holding Princess Leia hostage when Luke shows up to Cloud City. Interesting. And the so and the actor who plays Dengar is the same actor who plays the uh, Beast Handler Java. They reused a lot of uh, like the side like background character actors. Well, sure. I mean, it's cheaper. Obviously, you know, why not? People aren't really paying attention to these. Well, and the other thing is is that it's only a recent thing of using a, a bigger named actor to take a, a, a little small role in a film like that. that. You know? It's not like, you know, episode 7 where they got Daniel Craig to play as a stormtrooper. Right? Like, it's none of that shit. I didn't notice that. What, that Daniel Craig was a stormtrooper? Yeah. Yeah, in episode seven, yeah. 
the one when she uh like one line or something. yeah he only has a couple lines it's the, it's the scene where ray is escaping she uses the jedi mind trick on a stormtrooper oh, oh okay yeah that's that's daniel craig as the stormtrooper <laughs> well and it's it's uh in mandalorian it's what uh andy sadurkis or whatever the hell his name is he's uh the biker troop yeah because they got flack for punching uh like people were like like threatening them on like twitter yeah because <laughs> like, fucking because it's, it's toxic fan base <laughs> Like I, that that kind of bullshit doesn't surprise me because fucking so many toxic fucking nerds out there. No, it can't be this. No. Nope. Did have a little bit of a laugh when a certain comedian got a uh, somewhat recurring character. Paul <laughs> <laughs> got fucking what's his name, the former Imperial intelligence officer. Yeah. <laughs> Just to the top, like. In my, I wasn't visibly laughing because I try to stay quiet during movies, but in my head I was just like, fucking, having a ball. Like, like <laughs> then when he just blasts his former superior officer in his chair. Yeah, I, I. All I could think of, like, cause the Bill Blitter didn't seem really serious after to that scene, but all I can think of is like him and his, and his like stand up being like his. Face shrug with like his like you know smug smug smile like the blaster like you know what of it like and blaster in his hands like doing like the shrug shoulder shrug shit it's like mm, he had it coming yeah 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 <laughs> that's what's happening in my head like every time he was on screen it's like yeah I like <laughs> I like to think of was him as a tweet. <laughs> All right, that little loop on the back, I'm painting it like the straps of the backpack. Like it's, she's one, she's one strapping the backpack. So that's the other strap. That's what I'm assuming. But you know what happens when you assume. Right, Matt? Hey, there's more than one Sarlacc in the galaxy. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> okay. I'm uh, not giving up yet. Yeah. All right. <laughs> we are more than willing to be wrong, but I'm like, listen. Also, who's we? All I'm saying. Uh, actually, me and the other three people I turned on to this idea because we all think it would be fucking hilarious. But you haven't even watched the show. Yes, but I read the comics, and I... It's nothing like the comics. Every time, every time Boba Fett fell into the Sarlacc pit was funnier each time. Why is he Boba because Fett? Because I want... Say he's Boba. He's not Boba. He's Boba. It, it, it's a Midwestern thing. He's, he's Boba. Ah. No, I think it's a literacy problem. I mean... I mean... Midwesterners... Well, well, I mean, to be You fair, mean, or I mean? I mean, in, in the Midwest, it's not a motor, it's a moda. Moda? And, and, and if you go down south, it's not a toilet, it's a turlet. So what happens when you, you, you motorboat? It's a moda, not a motor. It's a motorboat. So it's a motorboat. You motorboat, motorboat son yeah. of a bitch. You old sailor. I'm not playing into you. No, Chris. I've learned this many times. I don't think you have, because you're here. I looked it up, and the actress that plays Fennec is uh, 58, and uh, she looks pretty fucking good for 58. Fucking right. <laughs> yeah, she looks fucking great for 58. Like stereotype for Asian women that even though if they're like fairly old, they still look you know kind of younger than they actually are. I was like, but for 58, she looks pretty fucking good. Yeah, you're damn right. So I either mean, she, that stereotype is a stereotype for a reason. Not really. She takes care of herself. I've seen some people who typically are, yeah, I've, I've seen some you know, that are stereotypically younger, younger looking, but look old as balls. That stereotype. Obviously, she takes care of herself because yeah. she's active and kind. But she looks pretty good mm-hmm. for 58. Yeah. I 
also didn't notice, notice this until uh, this last episode with, with the Boba is that Fennec in all of the epi episodes he's in in Mandalorian and Book of Boba so far, he has like these red hair eye things like scattered about in his hair. And I wonder if that's just like a hair design or if that like interfaces with his helmet some. Don't know. Yeah, I, I, she's an interesting character, and I think she is um, a good sidekick for Boba Fett, because at this moment of transitioning jobs and you know lifestyle for Boba, she kind of already is kind of like that, because like in Bad Batch, she's not a bad guy, even though she does kill a shit ton of people, she's not really a bad guy. Because she is kind of spoiler, she's watching out for Omega, which is kind of interesting. Which is why I'm curious to see what they do with Omega, the character of Omega. Now, it's a pretty standard affair. Whenever painting a, a button on a detonator, it's red, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it could be orange if you wanted. It could break the mold, maybe yellow. It could. But you, typically it's red because danger, I guess. Ooh. Stranger danger. Also because, you know, if it's a button you don't want to press, you obviously want to make it stand out and red stands out pretty good true especially when all there's like any other button so I'm like, oh, I just fucking press it I mean I, like I know the joke is like in the movies like everybody gets hacked at the red button but in real life a lot of the danger switches not even just red switches but like kill switches on planes and shit are red for a reason there we go they're red or or at least for a lot of hardware stuff they're also yellow or bright yellow You know what? I think you should just paint all your Eldar now with like high visibility safety jackets. Make a maximum amount of safe. Make sure they stand out. Everyone sees them. That's a possibility. I know you're trying to make a joke, but we could do it. You could. Could. You you could also be like the guy who spent. Hundred and fifty dollars on like a Forge World great unclean one, and then green stuffed him, so he was all smooth and healthy looking, just for the meme of having a great clean one. You could do it. Could but do why it. Would you? In the realm of possibilities. Well, you could do it because you're making a splenetic being. Is there other aspects of splenetic aside from boobies? True. There is peeners. There are glut, there are gluttonous. Uh, oh right, yeah, and gluttony. The new character sweet Solaris in AOS is literally a demon that likes to eat a lot. He's so fucking fat they gotta carry him around like it's a condom. Well, that's some uh, heresy I think I can get behind. What? That it's something splenetic without boobies or whatnot? Yeah, I mean there could also be peeners as well. Okay, booby or pee. -pee. Um, 
I'm trying to find the meme. There was a meme of where it was. Uh, on one side, it shows like a typical Chaos Demon Prince. And on the other side, it's just a dildo with googly eyes and like Mr. Potato Head arms. It says, what you think is going to happen when you pledge your soul to Slanesh, what really happens? What really happens? I know what really happens is you probably get turned into one of their fucking like human instruments to fucking demon ass play with. <laughs> probably. That dude I'm... has with his tendons ripped out of his back and turned into a heart. Matt checks out on that. I mean, it, it, it could be worse. You could become like a, an accordion instead of a harp. At least you became like an elegant instrument. Or you could become bagpipes. Like literal bagpipes? Or the instrument bagpipes? A lot, a lot of stories for mortal followers of chaos does not end well. <laughs> Even when they do all the rest of But most of the time, shit doesn't end. And half the time, it's not even because, you know, some paragon of order kills them. Half the time, it's because the chaos gods are like, haha, I'm bored playing with you, and then they turn you into a fucking swan, or like a flesh puddle, or a fucking demon's instrument. But he, here's here's the question: Are you better off being a chaos cultist or a gene stealer cultist? Because I mean, if you're a gene stealer cultist, you're gonna get digested. If you're a chaos cultist, you're probably gonna get turned into like the flesh puddle, the human instrument. But there's like that one percent chance you could do better. For most normal followers, at least in 40k, that aren't space marines don't really get to do better. Listen. Okay. I mean... I mean you might get, you Matt, might what do you mean? Better, as in, you might end up on a planet that's just instantly vaporized. <laughs> but Matt, what do you mean? I mean, on one... Well, I'm saying, on one end, you know you're gonna get eaten. On the other end, you may be able to do a little bit better than just well, getting eaten. Well, if you're a gene stealer cultist, you don't know you're gonna get eaten until that happens. When you're a chaos cultist, you're actually constantly living in thoughts and fear. <laughs> yeah. Gene stealer cultists are quite literally like in their lore. They're ignorant as bliss because they don't know if a high priest's going to show up and then after the battle's done, you know, fuck it, you know. They don't know that. True. And I mean, also, gene stealer cultists, they also get the battle limousine, so at least they get to look good before they get eaten. Basically, it sounds like you're trying to sell us on being gene stealer cultists. Uh, I'm not saying I'm a hard sell. I'm just saying that's what it sounds like. Actually, if I was trying to sell you something, I'd be uh, I'd try and make you a malice cultist because that's my that's my chosen chaos god, which kind of exists and kind of doesn't. So I would try and sell you on that. Kind of existing and kind of not sounds very non-committal. Uh, Games Workshop doesn't own the copyrights on the Chaos God Malice. So he hasn't officially been retconned, but they just don't talk about him and they don't acknowledge it. That's why. I mean, occasionally the Sons of Malice is Chaos Space Marines occasionally show up, but they're not. They don't reference him anymore. So he's in this weird legal limbo of where he kind of exists in the 40k universe and kind of doesn't. Uh, but no, I hate, I hate Tyranids and Gene Steelers as much as Gim hates Eldar. Which I understand, that's a very strong statement. But 
well, Gim in his formative years of 40k was getting raked by your Eldar. I was getting raked by specifically gene stealers. So I'm not the fan of bugs. Now, this is going to be a controversial topic, but, you know, hear me out. <clears throat> Can you use the term getting raped in a game where you consented to play? I'm like, I'm thinking, I'm like, I'm like, where it's like your first game of 40k, and your buddy pulls out like his tournament winning list, and just, and I'm like. But did like, you consent no to play? Did you consent to play? Yes. Then it's not rape. I'm like. <laughs> Um, yeah actually no I disagree I am. A, I was a minor at the time I was legally not allowed to give consent Warhammer is not for kids so you shouldn't have been playing uh, they said that now they didn't say that like 10 years ago it's always been that way well you know what then I broke the rules <laughs> Now it sounds like I'm doing victim blaming. <laughs> Matt, you shouldn't have worn don't worry so those tight pants. Well, do not represent the views of I know I should I should have that little disclaimer at the bottom of the of the screen. <gasps> oh, oh. I was sitting on the stairs when I came in. Oh. That's why I thought I burned down. <gasps> <gasps> Okay, hold on. I got, I got a... Shit was on my front door. I didn't know it was there. <gasps> is, it you were, is it what you were looking for? I don't know. I haven't fucking opened it. Oop, Jesus. Well, you don't have to open it. You can just look at the fucking label. And no, I, I... Well, the label is where I think it's from. Or I should say... Why don't you just shake the fucking box and listen for what's inside? It's a big box, and it's difficult to say. Are you saying you're too weak to lift up the big box and shake it? Oh, yeah! Yeah, that's what I think it is. Oh, oh, oh. Fucking so weak! You gotta, you gotta curb your enthusiasm. <laughs> I do. You're gonna get in trouble. I know, I might start hyperventilating. Curb your enthusiasm. Oh. I mean, we all know you're waiting for that box to build it. Yeah, and you know what? This is definitely going in my bum. This is 100% going in my bum. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, yeah, I'm. This was the final piece of the puzzle that I needed to have confirmed for me. So yes, uh, next week I will not be live streaming. Um, well, other than maybe way the brush, I most likely will do way the brush. But as far as he's getting projects done, uh, no. But with any luck, I'm going to get a nice little amount of uh, videos created. So, yeah. What time we had here? Holy shit, it's ten minutes after. Jeez Louise. Damn it, we didn't get her finished. I thought we were going to get her finished today, but apparently not. And whose fault is that? Yours. I mean, like, you know. I mean, I get it. Blame the victim. It's like you've been doing all fucking show, just blame the victim. Well, Matt, what were you doing there? What were you even doing there? You weren't supposed to be doing. You weren't even supposed to be playing. You can't consent. <laughs> That's awful. I, I know. Walked over, I walked over to my neighbor's house, and he's like, "Do you want to try working on this?" That's awful, dude. That's awful. <laughs> my neighbor said it was a great game. We should play with our shirts off. Then he tried to reach me over, bend me over, and give me a scoliosis test. The funniest part is, you have met that neighbor before too. Have I? Yeah. 
Uh, I'm drawing a complete blank. You, you have met you have met him at Adepticon. I mean, I've I've met a lot of people at Adepticon, dude. Uh, he does Julio's Woodshop. He was the booth kitty corner from you when Mini Wargaming actually officially showed up the second year. Oh. No, I'm still drawing a blank. But either way, okay, cool. That's that's interesting. Mm-hmm. So basically, what you're saying, you've you've basically ID'd the perpetrators. What you're telling me, right? Is what I'm hearing. Yes. Got gotcha. you. Yes. I hear you. Actually, it wasn't necessarily him. It was his nephew, but he didn't stop it. So it was a group effort. Interesting. Interesting. So there's multiple charges might have to be laid here. I hear you. I I, I was I was a big kid. They they needed two of them to like wrestle me to the ground. Jeez, now we're getting a little script. I don't want you to relive this. I don't want you to relive your trauma. Now, understand. I mean, I understand what you're saying here. I don't want you to relive it. So. Fifth, edi fifth edition Gene Steelers were the fucking worst. <laughs> yes. Gene Steelers in the melee edition of Warhammer. What could go wrong? <laughs> All right, well, I think that's uh, enough time for shitty jokes and <laughs> awful, awful, awful comparisons. So um, I'll let you go first, uh, Matt. Any parting words of wisdom? Um, I mean... Um, I'm sorry, someone else in the house just came in you with a fly swatter. <laughs> All uh, right. Come on. Uh, Spit it up. Because I can, I'm gonna, because I can, I'm gonna steal Chris's line again. There we go. Fuck him. Uh, take care of your brushes. They'll take care of you. Peace in the Middle East. Peace in Eastern Eastern Europe. Enjoy the rest of the year. Uh, go outside. Touch the grass. Spend time with the family. Do the things. All right, Matt. This Get isn't the fucking Oscars. Oscars. You're right, this is way of the brush. Have you gone senile, Chris? Do you know where you are? <laughs> All right, Boop, what do you got? Uh, don't be mad. <laughs> don't be mad. That's good advice. That's good advice. Yeah, just let it slide. Kim says, no play for Mr. Gray, so paint your fucking models. And uh, I, I agree. I agree, Kim. I do like how someone came up with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have a question. What if I have the really old minis where they... Uh, cast them in purple can i play with them because they're not gray yeah yeah well there we go right and uh legion yeah. um winky 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 legion winky all righty folks i mean if, I don't okay. know if legion sorry matt you're gonna keep talking okay i'm trying to end the fucking show here and you're, you're still talking okay what what i was gonna say i don't know if he can show his winky on twitch that may be against tos it might be. We're not going to find out though, unless you. Well, I mean, well, we can we can do a we can do a, uh, a, a private stream, just you and I, and then if you really want to, you know, compare Winkies, we can. For research purposes, Matt, just for research purposes, not gay. It's not gay. It's just research. Matt. Uh, whatever you say, LBJ. <laughs> All right, let's get the hell out of here.